Um, good morning, everyone. Today is Monday, February 27th. Uh, it is 1035 for our uh, monthly Boston Parks and Recreation Commission public hearing. Um, we have an acquisition on our agenda today. We are joined um, by our fellow parks commissioners, um, Lisa Birdseye, uh, Reverend Mariama White-Hammond, William Epperson, David Queerly, and Leonard Lee. Uh, also joined by the Executive Secretary of the Park Commission, Carrie Marsh Dixon, and our Chief Landscape Architect, Liza Meyer. There's also some staffers uh, joining us for this call to help clarify and present. And that is Paul Sutton, who oversees our Urban uh, Wilds uh, Division, as well as Aldo Guerin, who has worked through this acquisition process. And he's our senior planner at Parks. And Christine Brandau is gonna be staffing us and helping us with technical issues. So with that, I think that's our introductions and I'll pass it off to Carrie to introduce uh, this long item on the agenda. <laughs> yes, and we have been advised by the law department that we do need to read it all into the record. So um, this is a vote to execute an order of taking dated February 27th, 2023 to acquire the fee simple interest inclusive, inclusive of trees and structure standing upon and affixed there too of two parcels containing 51,545 square feet more or less of land now or formerly owned by Lakeside Development Partners, LLC, which land is located at unnumbered AKA zero and four Lakeside Avenue in the Hyde Park District of the city of Boston, numbered in the records of the assessing department as parcels 18129980000 and 18129990000 respectively and shown as parcel A on a plan dated May 18th, 2022, entitled Plan of Land Taken for Park and Passive Recreation Purposes by the Parks and Recreation Commission, City of Boston, Zero and Four Lakeside Avenue, Hyde Park District, Boston, Mass. Prepared by Joyce Consulting Group, PC, Braintree, Massachusetts, said land to be used for the community preservation purposes of providing a park, passive recreation, natural, historical, cultural, and archeological resource conservation, and public access to the great pond known as Sprague Pond. And to further vote that the supposed owner be awarded a sum of money set against their name as compensation for damages in their estate at zero and four Lakeside Avenue in the Hyde Park District of the city of Boston by the taking of their interest in the land for the community preservation purposes of providing a park, passive recreation, natural and historical, cultural and archeological resource conservation and public access to the great pond known as Sprague Pond and to further vote that said park shall be known as the Sprague Pond Shoreline Reserve. Great, so with that, um, is it gonna be Aldo who's? Yes. Uh, Aldo, are you uh, leading us in a presentation to the commission? You're on mute, Aldo, just so you know. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I'm gonna, uh, actually, I'm not gonna share my screen right now, I'm going to, um, you know, uh, just uh, talk about, um, you know, some background here. Uh, for several years, the Parks and Recreation Department has been engaged in a process of developing a program to acquire land for open space, not only from land owned by other city agencies or as the result of development processes such as transportation improvements and housing or commercial developments, but also privately held lands as well. Having that range enables the department to better fit expansion of the open space system to where the people are and will be and where the resources are and are needed. We begin, we began the development of the parcel priority plan based on environmental land use, recreational and social data to great parcels for suitability for open space. Both parcels that are the subject of today's hearing rate highly in the high 90s in the parcel priority plan ratings. Several years ago, the citizens of Boston voted in the Pre Community Preservation Act, thereby creating a community preservation fund sourced from property tax surcharges and allocations from the state treasury. On a yearly basis, the city's Community Preservation Committee disperses millions for affordable housing, historic preservation, and open space projects. One type of project that can be funded by the CPA is open space acquisition. 
the Department of the Air Force sought out this opportunity and put together applications for an open space acquisition fund. The 2021 CPA disbursement yielded 1 million. The 2022 disbursement yielded 1.3 million. And the 2023 disbursement will yield as of next month an, another 1.2 million. Therefore, we have a sizable fund, currently 2.3 million, but next month that'll be increased to 3.5. So the money is there to fund this acquisition and other acquisition projects, uh, that, uh, this acquisition project before you today, but also other acquisition projects that uh, we have in the works. Based partly on the high parcel priority plan ratings, on our knowledge that this site is highly sensitive for recreational, natural resource, historic preservation, and archeological cultural reasons. The very active and diverse community interests expressed for this acquisition, including the city's own Hyde Park neighborhood strategic plan, and the active threat of development to these highly sensitive resources in contradiction to the strategic plan's recommendation. The department chose these two parcels as our first project in acquiring privately owned parcels for public open space. It's a challenging project, not a turnkey type of project, but we are working diligently on this effort. I will go now to the presentation we provided the Parks Committee of the City Council when they held a hearing last June on the mayor's request to authorize in accordance with the CPA law the Parks and Recreation Commission to take by eminent domain this property and to authorize the commission to grant a conservation restriction on land acquired using CPA fund, again, per C the CPA law, to the Southwest Boston CDC. That'll be the subject of a second vote. Then afterwards, I will turn over to Paul Sutton, the Parks Department Urban Wilds Director, and Joseph Bagley, the city's archeologist to carry through our presentation. So now let me get back here. Uh, how do I switch? Okay, here we, we make go. Make sure Joe Bagley can get into uh, the panelists. Right. Okay. Um, whoops. So back um, back in June, this was uh, docket number 0653, uh, the order to authorize the uh, taking of this parcel, as well as to uh, grant the uh, CR. Uh, that's all required by the uh, Community Preservation Act. Uh, we're using Community Preservation Act funds to uh, acquire this parcel. Um, and as we'll refer a little bit later, we also have a state grant involved. So that will reduce the city's um, you know, uh, burden on acquiring this project. Uh, the state the state was very interested in this project and um, you know it was great to get their support. So we're seeking to acquire the land via eminent domain for a new park that we'll be calling the Sprague Pond Shoreline Reserve. And it has frontage on uh, Sprague Pond. Um, I think it was last year uh, that the uh, DEP uh, designated Sprague Pond to be a great pond. Great ponds are ponds that are currently or were at some point in its history, 10 acres or more in extent. And that was the case we were able to prove, uh, or the community was able to prove that it had been uh, 10 acres or more uh, in extent uh, in its past. It's now um, approximately eight acres in size. Um, so great ponds are considered state-owned resources. So uh, by virtue of that, uh, the state has a policy that uh, the, these uh, ponds are open to the public for swimming, um, fishing, boating. And so the, um, the only uh, concern with this policy is that uh, uh, how do you get uh, access to the water? And so um, there's uh, been a, you know, a active uh, uh, effort on the part of the state and also various other interests in the state to gain access to uh, great ponds because many of them often have um, surrounded by private property. Um, so we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've gotten monies from the Community Preservation Fund, the state park grant will help reimburse 
uh, Community Preservation Fund, partly for this acquisition. Uh, this land that we're talking about, a one acre site, is undeveloped and vegetated with trees and grasses. It provides scenic access to the Sprague Pond and to the Great Blue Hill. And there's a certain amount of uh, archaeological, cultural importance to that view to the Great Pond. And uh, we'll talk about it a little bit in, later, but mostly it'll, uh, that'll be part of uh, what Joe Bagley will be talking about. We're aiming to create a passive recreation-oriented park, uh, very naturalistic, uh, and it'll provide paths and access to for fishing and scenic viewing, and we'll be doing ecological restoration using native vegetation all in a, a later project. Uh, this acquisition was recommended uh, both by the uh, Boston Natural Areas Network, which is a uh, a land trust that uh, has now been uh, uh, merged into the Trustees of Reservations, which is a uh, over century old uh, land trust in uh, Massachusetts. They're uh, basically a private uh, state park system. And so uh, the Boston Natural Areas Network has some uh, urban wilds, uh, but also uh, uh, community gardens, and that all got absorbed into the trustees of reservations. Um, then uh, the in 2011, the High Park Neighborhood Strategic Plan also called for uh, that a Sprague Pond waterfront park be created, and they specifically, you know, mentioned this in in their mapping. And so um, uh, the uh, the commissioners have a larger size, uh, uh, you know, depiction of the uh, the plan here. This land is also within the state designated Ponkabog Pog Foul Meadow ACEC, the area of critical environmental concern. These are considered environmentally sensitive areas that require greater review by state agencies. So uh, you can see here, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but where it says uh, whoop, approximate location of Sprague Pond, that's in that little upper area there. It's within that green area. As I mentioned earlier, it was recently designated as a great pond, um, the per, um, Chapter 131, Section 45, every great pond shall be public for the purpose of voting and open to all inhabitants for fishing purposes. Uh, it's uh, in a um, environmental justice neighborhood, according to the state. And, um, you know, as it mentions that uh, here, many EJ populations are located in densely populated urban neighborhoods in and around the state's oldest industrial sites. And certainly this area of Reedville in Hyde Park qualifies as, a, 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 you know, a, a, a very industrialized area. Um, folks who live around here are cheek by jowl with uh, large uh, industrial and warehousing uh, uses. For the uh, state policy, uh, you know, such, you know, projects in such neighborhoods are favored and is one reason why uh, our grant application was successful. Uh, the uh, University of Massachusetts has done mapping to show uh, heat impacts during high heat events. Uh, and this area uh, is in the fourth quartile, meaning the most heavily impacted during uh, heat events. And so uh, let's see, yep, right about here is where Sprague Pond is. So this is considered uh, vulnerable to high heat events. So maintaining this um, vegetated site with access to water helps to maintain a cooling zone that uh, is, um, you know, beneficial for this highly vulnerable area. Whoops. Um, next. Oops. All right. So um, this has the potential of being a nationally significant historical, cultural, and archaeological resource, uh, particularly the fact that this was uh, located in uh, the area of uh, Camp Meigs, the Civil War training camp and hospital on the site. Uh, it was where the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer 
uh, regiment trained. They were the first military unit consisting of black soldiers to be raised in the North during the Civil War. Uh, another uh, infantry regiment, the 55th, was also um, you know, composed of black soldiers as well as the 5th Cavalry. And so uh, uh, the significance of this is um, paramount and uh, want to, uh, you know, uh, I've gotten many communications, as you noted, and uh, I've uh, noted in the information packet that uh, historians um, connected to uh, African American studies as well as Civil War history um, believe this is a very important site for the interpretation of uh, this aspect of the Civil War. And uh, again, this is uh, an example of that. Uh, um, mention here that um, there the um, determination and the heroism of these soldiers uh, is deemed oftentimes to help, have helped turn the tide in the Civil War. The only other site that is important in interpretation of uh, their history is Fort Wagner and uh, it's on the South Carolina coast and uh, is eroding away thanks to uh, sea level rise, hurricanes, and wave action. So this uh, this location is the best location to be able to yield artifacts and also uh, become a suitable site for a memorial and interpretation. Uh, I'm not going to say much on archaeology. Uh, basically, uh, Joe Magley has the thunder here, uh, but you can see here the Massachusetts tribe was the predominant tribe in this in the Boston area. Uh, the Massachusetts Historical Commission, in both its uh, comment letter on our state park grant, as well as uh, uh, for uh, a environmental review connected to the proposed development, indicated how archaeologically and historically sensitive this site was and recommended acquisition for open space to help protect and preserve any significant historic and archaeological resources that may be present. Uh, the city's acquisition of this land um, provides a mean to protect it uh, and to allow the public to access it for um, health and recreational and natural and scenic values. Um, uh, the uh, caption lower down mentions uh, a lot of what I discussed about the sources of funding. And so um, now I want to transition to what would happen after the um, boat is taken, and if that boat is in the affirmative, um, these are the actions that would take place. First, obtaining the signatures of the commissioners on the order of taking. Then um, when you vote on the second item, which is the vote on the conservation restriction, uh, you'd be authorizing Commissioner Woods to sign on behalf of the department. That would uh, that signature would then take place, and then we'd uh, obtain the signature of the, the grantee, the CDC, and also the uh, EOEA executive secretary. Um, then we record the order, the CR, and the park grant project agreement. Treasury will prepare a check for the owner to pick up external affairs at parks, and the mayor's office will work on an announcement event. The city archaeologist and the urban wilds program will meet to discuss the archaeological investigation process and how it includes people in the surrounding community, the descendants of the Mass 54th and those members of the Massachusetts indigenous community. And the design and construction unit, which in this case will primarily be uh, the urban wilds program, will begin a community engagement process uh, once funding is in place for any site improvements and uh, uses on the site. So uh, that concludes my portion of the presentation. I'm gonna hand it over to Paul Sutton. And then after that, Paul will hand it off to Joe Bagley. Great, okay. Um, yeah, my comments are, are fairly brief. Um, I would just say that the, the city has long been interested in access to and conservation of land at Sprague Pond. Um, it's interesting that the Boston Planning and Development Agency 
uh, first identified this area at Sprague Pond as an area of real conservation interest. And um, it's, it's, it's highly unusual that at this point that there's a, a pond in a, in a fairly natural state that's still largely intact within the city limits. Um, as you saw from some of uh, one of the pictures presented earlier, the pond edge is, is still largely vegetated despite some of the adjacent parcels being developed. But it's really, it really is the larger context. Uh, Aldo made reference to the, the Fowl Meadow and Ponkapog uh, ACEC. That's basically a very large uh, wildlife sanctuary complex. Um, the, the Fowl Meadow, in fact, has the largest wetland and floodplain in the entire Neponset River Basin. And the ACEC, it's, uh, it does, uh, it is home to a number of, of state listed rare uh, species. So it's a, it's a very significant area. Um, despite the fact that there is an industrial railroad corridor running nearby the site, the, because of that vegetated border around the, the pond, the water quality is still uh, quite good and capable of uh, supporting healthy fish populations. And again, it's that vegetated border that's so important to uh, supporting native and migrating um, uh, waterfowl, uh, uh, birds and waterfowl habitat. And, and again, it's, it's the, the idea of wildlife habitat corridors, its connection to the greater ACEC. So it's a very, very significant site in terms of natural resource values. Um, I, th I think with that, I would end and, and pass to uh, Joe to talk a little bit about archaeology. Good morning, everyone. So what I'll be sharing today is um, the story of the archaeological sensitivity of Sprague Pond. Because there hasn't been any archaeological excavations on the pond, a lot of this is um, kind of based on prior uh, experience in other places. Um, but I, I want to kind of stress today why I'm concerned about the site from an archaeological perspective. Um, Paul's talking also about ecological impacts, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be talking as much about that. So the way we review uh, whether a site is archaeologically sensitive, which essentially means, do we think there could be a good chance that there's an archaeological site on a property? Uh, some of the things that we look for is its proximity to water, it's um, relative topography related to other areas. Um, specifically, does it does it have a space that can actually rise up from the surrounding area for uh, essentially drainage? Does it does it create a dry space? Does it have significant view sheds, or is it near significant ecological features? Things like waterfalls, the confluences of rivers, um, significant mountains, uh, views of the shoreline, things like that. And is it also near other archaeological sites that have already been documented because areas of significance tend to have um, significantly more presence of native archaeological sites in the ground? What I want to stress before we go forward from here, um, two significant parts of this. Um, one is an acknowledgement that uh, Massachusetts sites here in Boston, but also in the surrounding area, are not exclusively identified through the presence of native creations or native artifacts, um, but that is one way that archeologists like me are able to document those sites. So things like pottery, um, stone tools, uh, shells from food and other types of uh, bone related to food, but also burials as well. Um, those are the archeological evidence of sites, um, but not necessarily the exclusive evidence of, of um, the presence of native people on a landscape. Um, I also wanted to, to um, uh, just to acknowledge that the decisions that and the, and the recommendations that I'm making here about the sensitivity is also based on a walkover that I did with um, Ferris Gray, who's a Sagamore, the Massachusetts tribe, uh, the number two in the, in the tribe and what's considered the war chief or as it is interpreted today, the land chief of the tribe, who also does significant work on other projects, including Long Island, to read landscapes and to work on um, ways to determine, like I do, the archaeological sensitivity of a site, but his um, his experience is more through the ceremonial use of landscape, which doesn't always have actual archaeological artifacts associated with that. So one of the uh, key reasons why I'm looking at Sprague Pond as a place of sensitivity, regardless of what's planned for it or who owns it, um, is the topography itself. 
Uh, I'm going to uh, speak mostly about the southern end of the property where there's a significant topographic high that overlooks um, the entirety of, of Sprague Pond. Uh, some of the other landscape features that you see further to the north of the property, I believe, is actually related to an ice uh, manufacturing company or ice cutting company that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but that topographic high is one of those high and dry locations. Um, it also uh, is uh, very close to the shoreline. We don't typically have uh, kind of topography that overlooks water in Boston because our shoreline tends to be right up against the ocean or right up against rivers. And ponds are remarkably rare in Boston, as um, both Paul and Aldo mentioned. Uh, this is one of only three that I believe exist uh, remaining natural ponds in Boston, including Cow Pond um, out in West Roxbury and Jamaica Pond. Um, it's not the largest pond in the world, but it is an extremely significant uh, source of standing fresh water in Boston and one of the few places where that exists still today. So this is another view from the property looking due east. The, the landscape or the vegetation didn't terribly help me in this process, but um, what I'm trying to get across is the, the view of um, Great Blue Hill from the shoreline of, um, of Sprague Pond, but also kind of the slope that leads down to the western shore of Sprague Pond. Um, this is a better image that shows the relative topography and other proximity of the site to significant places to the Massachusetts people. So the Massachusetts um, today are the Massachusetts of Ponkapog, uh, but they began their existence as the Naponset Band of the Massachusetts, uh, where their traditional homelands were in Boston and, the, and surrounding the Naponset watershed. When the um, King Philip's War uh, began and the tribe was relocated, they were relocated to Ponkapog in, in Canton, which is on the southern, the southern large pond south of the Blue Hills here on this image. Um, this site in particular is located due west of the Neponset River, which has been significant to the, Nepon uh, to the Massachusetts, the Neponset, Massachusetts for their entire existence. But it also has an important view due east at the rising sun and uh, Great Blue Hill. And the Blue Hills themselves are, um, are religiously significant um, and ceremonially significant to the Massachusetts uh, as their language translates to the people of the Blue Hills. Um, so this is a very significant uh, landscape feature, very significant uh, proximity, um, and also a very significant view shed, all increasing the chances of there being um, both a, the, a native site on the property and potentially a ceremonially significant site on the property. Um, other sites that are found in the area, um, I can't release a map of where these are located, but I can describe them. Uh, the the actual um, map, the official state maps of where archaeological sites are, there's a significantly large site that usually indicates that we're not exactly sure where it was, um, that places the actual location of this property within the boundaries of the Manor site or the Dees site, which is also known as 19 NF42. That was a site that was collected in the early 1900s by an avocational collector in the vicinity of Sprague Pond um, and in the area east of the pond and around the pond. So this is currently technically within the boundaries of an existing site, but we don't know the exact boundaries of that site. So it may, may or may not be part of the manor site. It's also within a kilometer of several important sites that we already know about, including the Multiple Resource National Register District for the Blue Hills um, in Canton, which is the location of the Massachusetts Hornfells, the Braintree Slate, and the Blue Hills Rhyolite uh, quarries, which were uh, the source of uh, the Massachusetts, but the main source of the Massachusetts uh, stone tool materials, in, in addition to the uh, Mattapan quarry, which is in Babson Cookson tract in Mattapan. There's also the Capon School site and the Depronset Bridge site. These are all within a kilometer of the, um, the property that we're talking about. And as I said earlier, the sensitivity of a site also is based on how close it is to other known sites. And this is a relatively uh, dense area of archeological sites. It's also a relatively unsurveyed area. So the fact that we already have this number of sites in an area that really hasn't been looked at archeologically that much really indicates that this is a pretty heavily, um, uh, heavily used area and an important area to the Massachusetts, mostly because of the view shed and the proximity to the Neponset and nearby rivers and it being one of the few natural ponds in the landscape. Um, that's not the only sensitivity, though, on this site. This has, site has both native and historical archaeological sensitivity. Uh, the way we determined that is the presence of um, potential or documented use of a property, and then its likelihood for preservation, because ultimately, if a site has been the site, uh, uh, the location of a five-story building with a two-story basement, 
um, no matter what has been recorded on the site, it would have likely been disturbed. And so um, what I do when I look at archeological sensitivity is I try to go through existing images, maps, aerial photographs to determine whether or not retained sensitivity um, due, to, due to potential development or disturbance. Um, so this is, the site is within Camp Meigs um, or Camp Meigs, Boston HA.5, which is um, a state inventory historical archeological site that essentially is, is bounded um, within the existing known historical boundaries of Camp Meigs. And I'll talk a little bit more about where that is relative to this property. So in 1831, we have a map showing Sprague Pond and the Neponset River down to the uh, lower part. North is to the right in this image. Sorry, I didn't have a chance to spin everything around. Um, but we're essentially looking here at the arrow on the west side of Sprague Pond, showing a relative lack of development in 1831. This is important not for historical reasons, but to show that it's good. It has a good likelihood that by 1831, relatively little had happened to the western shoreline of Sprague Pond to potentially disturb earlier sites. So this is important for the con uh, for the integrity of the site overall. By 1851, you can see again there's been relatively little development. We have the building of Sprague Street. We have a couple of um, properties: Sprague Place, Alden House, um, and a couple of roads developing northwest of the site, and of course the railroad that went through a portion of the pond kind of cutting off the eastern side of the pond. Um, and that rail railroad is still present today. And again, the Neponset River on the right. And then of course, by the Civil War, we have Camp Meigs. Um, this is a reconstruction map from the 20th century of where things were located in Camp Meigs. Um, it's always a question as to whether or not the reconstructed maps are accurate or less accurate, more accurate or less accurate than the period maps. Um, but the, you'll see that they both relatively agree with each other. Um, you can see on this property, on this map, the Sprague Street, which is still located in its current location, is immediately, um, and the property itself is immediately across the street from the barracks related to the 20th century, I'm sorry, to the um, Camp Meigs actual, um, the camp itself. Uh, that means that this place would have been potentially an area for mustering where people would actually be able to stand and gather, but also a place of um, potential recreation for the troops that were coming to, uh, coming to Camp Meigs being a freshwater pond adjacent to barracks and with lacking running water at the time, this could also be a bathing area for the camp itself. Um, this is that same map overlaid on top of an existing aerial photograph of the site. And what I wanted to show here was a couple of things. One, um, the relative proximity of the important uh, Camp Meg's uh, um, barracks and uh, other infrastructure, but also the um, large amount of development that has happened within the camp. The reality is that though this is a relatively small piece of property, I think it's about an acre, it's still one of the largest remaining undeveloped portions of Camp Meigs in existence. And if there are, is archeological sensitivity that remains within the camp itself, you can see that it's not necessarily going to exist within Reedville neighborhood itself, although it may be within individual tiny spots within people's individual yards, but even the DCR Camp Meigs um, Park has been heavily modified for the uh, for the recreational facilities and may not retain much of its um, much of its camp um, archaeological uh, data. Um, this may be one of our few chances left to have any piece of undeveloped Camp Meigs remain um, in its in its essentially undeveloped natural state as it would have been open space during the 1860s and 1850s. Here's a bit more of an accurately drawn map that shows some of the varieties of structures of, of, of uh, Sprague Pond itself, including the river that cut through it. Really, the only the lower um, left kind of lobe of Sprague Pond still exists today. Um, this also shows uh, another additional uh, component of the uh, of the camp that is, sorry, it's a little bit hard to see, but these are stables um, just to the left, uh, southwest of the, of the shoreline of Camp Meigs, more or less abutting this property. Stables would have been for the horses associated with the uh, camp itself. And again, the barracks are located across Sprague Pond, today kind of in an industrial area. So this is really kind of a crossroads between multiple spaces in the um, in the camp itself. And with barracks, stables, and uh, hospitals located essentially on either side of the pond, uh, this would have been really a crossroads and a heavily traveled area along Sprague Street up to Reedville Station and then back down into, um, into the camp and the open water areas surrounding 
uh, Sprague Pond, especially this area, which would have been the largest and deepest part of the pond, would have been critical for uh, the recreational and leisure activities of the of the uh, troops that were stationed in Camp Meigs. Oh, here we go. This is a close-up version of um, the property, showing the closeness of the stables relative to um, relative to the property today, which is just north of the stables line. Sorry, I didn't put an outline there. Um, later on in the 1900s, we have very little development. Uh, the property was divided up into four lots. Um, you can see the outline of the current property in blue, and you can see that the southern lots were never developed, as far as I can tell. Um, however, there was a significant building on the northern end of the property, which is today the main entrance area of the property. Here it's labeled in um, kind of X marked buildings, which is uh, often kind of an outbuilding or kind of a supplementary building to a main structure. Uh, in this case, it's likely associated with, Char well, not likely, it is associated with Charles Davenport. We can see him as the owner um, or the Davenport family as the owner. This is a historic document from, my screen's partially covered, January 190 something um, by Charles E. Davenport of Hyde Park. He's an ice dealer. He's built an ice house on Sprague Pond in Reedville, which will hold 4,000 tons of ice. And it's installed runs, chains, and scrapers there in ready readiness for harvesting. Um, he has bought his ice during the past few years. Uh, so what that means is that Sprague Pond in the winter, although probably not this winter, uh, would freeze over uh, and significantly and form a significant layer of ice. People would go out with saws, cut that ice, and then bring it to the ice house, which was located on the northern part of this property, where it would then be stored, um, cut into smaller pieces, and then ultimately sold to ice dealers, um, and they would end up in ice boxes inside individual homes. Um, there's many, many uh, similar ice uh, factories like this, um, including at, Char um, at Chandler's Pond, out in Cow Pond, where my lab is located in West Roxbury. These are not uncommon. However, there's never been, or there's very rarely a park or open space associated with an ice um, house that could potentially have an archaeological component. Um, but we would look for things like uh, ice cutting materials, ice um, ice crampons for, for uh, shoes, the saws, the chains, and uh, landscape evidence of both the ice house itself, which could be a significantly deep hole, which would have been filled um, with hay and ice uh, put in the ground to help the ground itself ice, um, insulate the, the hole, um, and then anything related to that property. During, during my walk over with Ferris uh, from the Massachusetts tribe, last year around this time, um, I did identify one uh, surviving uh, archaeological feature, which is this um, stone wall. It's really hard to make out in this image, so I put a little kind of visual outline. This is the, the edges of a uh, stone foundation located at the northern end of the property. Um, I believe that this is... Um, this is portions of the ice house, uh, possibly um, the area that you would drive up to with carts. And then the area essentially where I'm, where I'm photographing and looking at this uh, structure would have been the area where the ice was dragged up underneath the building or into the building. So there's, there's really three components of this site. We have the um, potential native archeological site. We have the Camp Migs um, historic archeological site, and then also the ice house archeological site, all of which are, um, at least the first two are definitely potentially significant. And the ice house, fortunately, is on one end of the property, leaving the majority of the property undeveloped. So I don't expect that this would have disturbed the site heavily. So for archaeological sensitivity, basically it's sensitive for those three properties that I just talked about. There is no current protections for the property. Um, there's no landmark status or state triggers for it. If it's owned by the city, which um, then we can then uh, work to, towards um, committing to both the tribe, the 54th descendants and the community on creating a park that is designed with archeology span in mind um, and uh, approach the site essentially asking the community, which in this case is the communities defined as the, the neighbors, the folks that use this place, um, the Massachusetts tribe and the descendants of the 54th, what questions do they have about the property? What do they think is significant about this property? Um, and then how do we either answer those questions through archeology span or address those questions when the design of the park is created? Do we proactively survey the property before anything happens just to get a baseline understanding of what's there? Or is the recommendation to actually leave the site undeveloped or untouched archaeologically until there's a develop until there's a plan for what the park should look like, whether it be seating or pathways, and only dig in those areas that are potentially going to be disturbed by the pathways? 
Um, and the reason why uh, that's insignificant, I'm going to back up just a little bit here. Sorry, everybody. I just want to show you the topography really quickly. Um, that southern end of the property, that high and dry location, um, I'm talking to Ferris in the Massachusetts, he's indicated that that would be a really good location for ceremonial use by the tribe, but also that dryness and that high location located next to the pond. Um, it's not by any means a definite, but it's a potential location for burials. Um, so that's something that if there's a potential for that, then the question becomes, should any archaeology even be considered or should the goal be to leave that completely untouched because it could be so significantly uh, significant culturally um, that it should be left undeveloped undug and essentially preserved in place for ceremonial use and for passive recreation. Those are the kinds of questions that we will approach this project with, um, with Paul and the, the parks team over the upcoming um, months and years. And I think that's it for me. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Although, is there anything else in the presentation before we go on that you'd like to add until we get to the questions? Yes. Um, one more thing, and that is, uh, you know, we've talked about the value of the land and, and such, but um, uh, in, in terms of uh, the public's interest. And so uh, to obtain this land, we're going to be using the, the process of eminent domain. And eminent domain um, involves just compensation for the property owner. Uh, and so what we've done is... Uh, proceed according to uh, MGL chapter 79. That's the state law regarding eminent domain. And that requires that we uh, pay a fair market value via uh, as determined by an appraisal. So what we've done is obtain uh, two appraisals. Uh, it's in order to make sure that we, um, you know, uh, get a pretty good read on what the uh, fair market value is. And what I want to mention about fair market value is uh, uh, this, the uh, uh, there's fair market value as most of us understand. And then in the eminent domain context, it's actually uh, slightly different. Uh, what that means is um, in, uh, in the market, there's a whole range of values, as we know, uh, when you go out to buy a car, you can sometimes get a really great price. Sometimes, you know, you're, you know, a billionaire and you don't care. And sorry. And so you'll pay that really, you know, high price. And then um, most people try to get, you know, end up getting somewhere in the middle because, you know, the auto dealer wants some decent return, et cetera. So there's somewhere in the middle of that range. That's the typical um, market value that appraisers normally look for. But in the in eminent domain context, it's that highest value. They're looking for that one. And so in this context, with the two appraisals that we've done, and we've done an analysis of both of them, and both in terms of uh, the um, accuracy, et cetera, of uh, the uh, competence and so on of the two appraisals. The, uh, plus, uh, it just seems to make more sense if we're trying to achieve this higher value. The appraisal that has the higher uh, number uh, was the one that was chosen. And uh, in this instance, that number is $940,000. So we're uh, the vote for the, uh, that the Park Commission will uh, consider later on, uh, that motion will state that value in the, um, in the vote. So uh, I just wanted to make that clear for everybody. Uh, that is substantially less than the amount that the uh, owners paid. Um, it was uh, the deed uh, shows that they had paid 325,000, um, but, uh, Given uh, what the uh, what the market actually uh, you know says that we you know uh, need to consider et cetera the potential here um, the limitations of uh, zoning which allows only three units to be developed here again per the uh, neighborhood strategic plan this was uh, determined to be a highly sensitive area and therefore 
while it, the recommended parkland acquisition here, uh, oh, this neighbor, this plan by our planning agency cannot say, you know, this has to be a park. They have to allow for uh, private development. However, it was zoned conservation protection subdistrict to try to the extent possible uh, limit development on it and it was limited to three units. And the um, Rolos development st sticks to that, um, uh, you know, that zoning limitation. So, um, yeah, and that's it. Uh, so uh, at this point, you know, uh, Commissioner Woods, uh, you know, I hand it off to you. Thank you, Aldo. Thanks for all the work and research that I know you put in this over over some years. Thank you. On this project and other acquisitions um, for the, on behalf of the Parks Department. So thank you for that. With that, we'll open it up to um, questions from the commissioners that they have on this. I um, I just want to state that since I am a curator of the Hyde Park Historical Society and the, the society has been involved with research and advocacy on behalf of this project that I'm going to recuse myself from the vote. Thank you, Commissioner Bruce. Um, I, I, I can start with a question too to get things off. Aldo, you mentioned, I think in the presentation that this did go uh, before the city council. Was that a vote from the city council and the affirmative for? Uh, for this? Uh, yes. Uh, they voted unanimously for this authorization to take and to, um, you know, uh, authorize a conservation restriction. So, uh, yes, they uh, uh, both, it was unanimous at the committee level and at the uh, city, full city council level. And then it was signed, uh, the order was signed the next day by uh, the mayor. Questions that David, Leonard, William, or Chief White Hammond have? No questions. Just wanted to um, compliment everybody who did all the research on this. It's an extensive amount of research. And uh, thanks to everyone who worked on this. Thank you. Uh, similarly, I don't have a question. The presentation was quite thorough. And there have been a few public hearings on this matter that I have uh, observed. So I, I feel like I've gotten a good deal of information. Um, and I think more of a comment, if there were a for sale sign out front, I think all of us would be very keen to say, where do we sign? Um, my, my concern that I'm hoping to get a little bit of uh, confidence in is the fact that we're pursuing eminent domain, a taking of, of private property. So I think I, I might have some questions after we proceed with the public hearing. Uh, but I, for one, would, would like to hear the, the testimony that folks are prepared to give today in support or opposition for the taking. Thanks, William. Reverend White Hammond or uh, Leonard, anything further from you? Sim similar to uh, Mr. Jefferson, I've heard about this quite significantly and received this presentation. So I think most of my questions have been um, settled. Pretty much the same here. Uh, being very, very close to uh, the 54th and what's happened in Boston, I just think this is, on one end, it's pretty amazing. Uh, but then on the other end, I just, just want to make sure when we do things on eminent domain that we're making sure we're dotting the I's and, and crossing the T's in terms of fairness. Uh, but I appreciate all the work that's gone into this, and uh, uh, I want to thank you publicly for everyone involved. Thank you. Thanks. Liza, any comments on your end? No, thank you. With that, we will open it up to public comments. If you please raise your hand uh, if you'd like to comment publicly on this. Um, Christine will let you in, and I'm sure she'll explain some more rules that I don't know about on how to let people into the room, uh, et cetera. If you want to raise your hand, I'll unmute you. Um, and if you're on the phone, um, if you hit star nine, I can unmute you. Um, Helen, Helena, I'm sorry, you can go first. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for this presentation. Um, for those who have been following this particular imminent domain taking, have probably heard my voice speak about this. So I'm going to try to 
just capture some snapshots. And first and foremost, let me, I'm Helena Tung. I've lived in High Park since 1974, and I'm currently the president of Belknell Family Neighborhood Association in High Park. I just wanted to um, put in a couple of key points that I've put into all of these public hearings in and around this, these particular parcels. And that is, um, we do have a city process for the development of properties on parcels, um, which you know requires a butters meetings, which requires BPDA, BPDA review and approval, maybe conservation commission, and if necessary, a MEPA review. All of these have been passed in flying college for the developers that had potentially wanted to develop this land for a family, in particular, an African-American family, both parents who are public servants. And I think that's mentioned in the last public hearing. And I would suggest before this vote is taken that all please review that last public hearing. Not that this would change the course of action in this vote, but I think it's important that we speak truth to power and that we speak to the record and that we add all the pieces. And I have been part of this since the BPDA review many years ago, sat in the audience. So if we're gonna have a process and a procedure to go about with proposed development, and this was going to be a family home for a large family, for public servants, if we're gonna have a process and then throw it out the window, then why are we having a process? And two, they had included access to the pond as part of their drawings after they realized it by purchasing the property that many of the residents in the area were using their property for access to Sprague Pond. So I keep hearing this as this was not part of the plan and Sprague Pond being designated as a great pond was part of the reason to, uh, you know, to have access. That was being neighborly. So I'm asking that before a vote is taken, that you please review all the public hearings in and around this manner. So this matter, this these parcels, so you have all the complete information and that we decide if we're gonna go through this process, we should go through it. But the previous process that the owners who have purchased this property, a butters meeting, passed that with flying colors. BPDA passed that with flying colors. Conservation Commission passed that with flying colors. Was put in a request for a MEPA review, not required. So at what point do we determine this process is okay that we're going through now, but the previous process that they went about is no longer, it's not applicable. So I just asked you to please review the hearing. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me to the Belknell Family Neighborhood Association at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you very much. Christine, next. Yep, Pat. Good morning, can you, can you hear us? me? Yep, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, hi, my name is Pat okay. Alvarez. Um, I'm, I've been a Hyde Park resident for 27 years. I'm the assistant director of the Southwest Boston Community Development Corporation and I'm in charge of our green initiatives program. I am urging the Parks Commission to approve the taking of the lakeside parcels on Sprague Pond and to approve Southwest Boston CDC's holding of the conservation restriction for this site. I mean, it's all been said, the, the research and the historical and archeological issues have been explained very clearly. Um, lakeside, you know, Sprague Pond is of great historical value, both because of the Massachusetts tribe uh, and because of Camp Meigs where African-American soldiers trained and may have died of illness and may be buried on the site. For all these reasons, it is a sacred site. Um, the lakeside parcels provide the only remaining access to Sprague Pond and my understanding and the State Department of Environmental Protection has declared this as a great pond. This is a huge, uh, a huge event. Um, it, and it is state policy that there should be access to great ponds. We all know Jamaica Pond, how cherished that is, how used that has been for, 
for so very long and will continue to be, for all these reasons, the lakeside parcels um, need to be taken, but the owners of this property need to be paid fair market value. Um, and I know the parks is going to do that and it, it must be done. Um, once the city takes ownership, Southwest Boston CDC is pre prepared to hold the conservation restriction, working closely with the parks department to care for the site, to report on its condition every year and to report any inappropriate activity so that we make sure that it remains a healthy uh, and beautiful place that people can come and enjoy the pond, enjoy the green space, enjoy the view of the Blue Hills. Um, the Southwest Boston CDC has run our Youth Jobs and Environmental Stewardship Program in partnership with the Parks Department for the last 14 years. We hired youth from around Boston, but primarily Hyde Park, Rosendale, Mattapan and Dorchester to restore conservation land in our environmental justice community. And they're taking responsibility for caring for this land and watching over it. Learning about its history would be an incredible opportunity for them, extremely motivating for them. Um, so I would be honored to be able to hold the conservation restriction and have our youth play a role in that. So we strongly urge your vote in favor of taking this land to protect it um, and in favor of Southwest Boston CDC holding the conservation restriction in working in partnership with the Parks Department to protect it for current residents and for future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Thanks for your testimony. Christine, next. Emily. Thank you. Emily Carrara. Hi, this is Emily Carrara from State Rep Rob Consalvo's office. Um, I just wanted to um, have the record show Rep Consalvo's strong support of the Parks Commission approving this acquisition. And thank you all for your work on this and for the presentation today. Thank you, Emily, for your testimony. Neponson staff. Somebody's known as Neponson staff. Yep. Hello, yes, this is. Ian Cook, uh, I am the uh, executive director of the Neponset River Watershed Association, and I just wanted to take a moment to um, express our strong support for the city proceeding with this application. And without belaboring the the really robust presentation we saw, you know, this property really has everything in terms of uh, what you would want in a piece of land worthy of public protection. You know, it's uh, ecologically significant as the entity that nominated the Falmetto uh, and the Ponset River ACEC uh, many years ago. Uh, this this area was intentionally included in that nomination uh, and, and greatly strengthened uh, the nomination because of its uh, significance, both ecologically, recreationally, historically, in terms of prehistory. It's just really, frankly, miraculous that this this pond is is still here. I think one of the things that's, um, in some ways, maybe most surprising about this, and not not that anybody is uh, proposing uh, actively encouraging swimming here, but it, it's it's in such uh, intact shape that the water quality actually meets swimmable water quality standards um, even today, which which cannot be said for uh, certainly for the Neponset River as it makes its way through Hyde Park. So just an amazing piece of property um, and definitely want to encourage uh, the city to um, to proceed with acquiring it. And would just note, you know, I, I too wish that, um, you know, the city would have, uh, you know, proactively acquired this property many years ago, but I'd, I'd observe, and this is not unique to the city of Boston, all across the watershed, Communities have many um, valuable properties on their uh, open space acquisition plans that that lang languish there for years and years um, until somebody comes along and um, actually uh, proposes to develop them. And uh, you know, suddenly, uh, with with uh, all other options off the table, uh, important acquisitions can can be accomplished. You know, so well, it would be great if this had been acquired proactively many years ago. I think uh, it's really critical that. Um, the city take advantage of this opportunity while it still exists. So thank you very much. 
Thank you again for your testimony. See, I think we have a phone in caller. Um, so the last three digits, four, four, five, it's a phone number. Yes, good, good afternoon. Um, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, my name is Craig Martin. I'm with the um, Reedville Watch Neighborhood Association, also the Hyde Park Neighborhood Association. And I do want to clarify in, in, in strong support of, um, of acquiring this parcel. But I do want to clarify um, a matter that um, Aldo had uh, mentioned uh, recently. Um, saying that when he was trying to assess the fair market value, saying what, that, that it was allowing the three condos that was proposed, um, that they were allowed there, but they actually weren't. I want, I want the commissioners to understand this, that when this was presented to the zoning board, the um, proponents, did, it requires a contiguous acre in order to have those three units put on there according to the Conservation Protection District. Required um, a continuous acre. However, in reality, there is a, a cart path since, since historic colonial days that actually bisects those two parcels, and it's owned by the city. So the, the, the zoning board was never informed of the city-owned parcel that goes from the top of the slope straight down to the pond. They presented it as two abutting parcels that when combined could make an acre. But indeed, you couldn't combine them because there was a city-owned parcel, that, again, that goes from the top of the slope right down to the bottom that was never presented by the proponents to the zoning board. So indeed, when you're, when you're determining fair market value, it's not um, allowed to have three um, condo units built there because there is a city-owned parcel that uh, um, swath of land that bisects those two parcels. So it's not when you're considering fair market value. You can't consider that the three condos as proposed could have gone there. No, they couldn't. Um, and that hasn't been, um, that hasn't been illustrated um, to the city hall um, uh, enough. I've tried my best. But I, I, I want that to, uh, to be on the record. And, and indeed, because of that, perhaps, although I want this acquired, perhaps, um, as Aldo was referring to the law, was saying, let's go to the higher end value. I'm thinking more to the middle. Um, I think the actual true fair market value is what those proponents had just bought the land for. That's usually the definition of fair market value. Um, I think that's closer to value of this, of this land. Um, and fairly compensates them so that they don't go out with a loss. Um, they actually get compensated what they paid for. Um, um, but I, I want the commissioners to know that, and I, I appreciate you giving me this time this, after, this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Um, I don't see any others. Christine, do you? Oh, we oh, have one more. Oh, yep. Oh, two more now. Roy? Roy? Roy, can you hear us? Are you still muted, maybe, Roy? Can you hear no, me now? Oh, yes, we hear you now. Okay. Hey, how are you doing? Sorry about that. I'm new with this. Uh, I bought the property, and um, I just want to say, I've said this before, that several years ago, I mean, maybe about 20 years ago, I was interested in the property from Mr. Homer himself. And I went down to City Hall, in uh, Boston, and I quiet about the property, and he, I said, I wanted to buy a home, you know, build another home for children in the future, as the uh, other gentleman wanted to, and they flatly said, no, it's undeveloped land, and that was the end of it. He said, I'd be buying just a piece of property, so I, I let that go. In 15 years, I went down again to do the uh, Homestead Act on my house, because I paid for it, and I asked, I quiet about the property again, and they told me, looked up the records, no, it's undeveloped land. I cannot business or residential land. That was the end of it. So I forgot it. Then all of a sudden, several um, several years later, real estate agents start coming around inquiring people. And I believe I knew one of the people who wanted to buy it at the time. I ran into them and they said it'd be a useless piece of land to buy. So I was shocked when these uh, other gentlemen came up and said they're going to build three condos here 
And it just threw me off. I just didn't understand this, where this came from. And I, I think it's a nice place. I used to, I, I went down there, everyone does go fishing and stuff like that. And uh, I clean it up. And of course, more and more you learn into it. You do find out there's a lot of history, especially Civil War, I like. And uh, that's about all I have to say, but thank you very, very much for your time and the effort to acquire this, at least for a park is, you know, God's not, not making any more dirt and this would be nice to have the people, the public. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. Roy, would you just state your full name for the record so we have it for the, the um, testimony? Uh, Roy Crosley, C-R-O-S-S-L-E-Y. Thank you very much, Mr. Crosley. Thank you. You're welcome. Francis? Frank, you there? Yeah, hi, good morning. Uh, Frank O'Brien here with uh, my colleague, Ms. Aguidello on behalf of Hyde Park Historical Society. Uh, Commissioner Wood, Chief White Hammond, members of the commission, Hyde Park Historical Society, we do have a brief statement, which we'd like to read. Um, and just a little bit of background. Additionally, Ms. Aguidello provided expert research and knowledge during the two and a half years leading up to this hearing. And, uh, there's been a lot of work, as we heard from the city archaeologist and from Ian, the Ponce River Watershed Association, Master EP Waterways, and many community volunteers. Um, the Hyde Park Historical Society respectfully recommends favorable action by the commission on the matter now before you. We don't need to recount the many compelling, solemn reasons that the site is worthy of protection. Uh, the historic, cultural, and natural resource values have been fully set out. Uh, in the mayor's transmittal letter in the staff presentations. Acquisition of the land is a 40 year positive fulfillment of neighborhood based priorities achieved through collaboration with the city and state for which we are grateful. The Hyde Park Historical Society would like to underscore for the commission our hope and expectation that payment for the lakeside parcels will be the full and just compensation allowable by law. We fully acknowledge the time, work, and expense that the development group has incurred. Uh, we really respect their entrepreneurial goals. And during this process, there were several strongly argued moments. And Mr. Gregory and Mr. Brown, uh, I apologize to them in, by letter, but also would like to do so here if they're on the call for any offense or aggravation during this time. Uh, the development group was fulfilling its business objectives and standing up for their private property rights, which are really bedrock principles and must be available to all. Um, we conclude by thanking the commission, Secretary Dixon, Paul Sutton, city legal st staff, Ms. Brown, the CPA committee, Aldo, Mr. Guerin, Commissioner Woods, Chief White Hammond, Councils Arroyo and Lara, and Representatives Consalvo and Scotia and Mayor Wu for all the work and time in this matter. Thank you. Mr. O'Brien. Christine, are you seeing any others? I'm not seeing any others either. Oh, actually, no, oh. got one more. Or George Brown. George, can you hear us? Yes, hello. Hello. Hi, George. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, I'm George Brown. I'm a member of the uh, 54th Mass Regiment, Company A, and uh, I'm calling uh, about a letter we sent of February 25th, 2022, to Mariama White Hammond, Chief of, of the Office of Environmental and Open Space. And we are in support of what you're doing. And uh, it, it reads briefly, uh, the parcel, a part of Camp Meigs, which was the training ground of the Civil War era 54th Mass Infantry Regiment. And uh, I would rather not just read the whole letter because it just uh, states the same thing you have discussed already. But we are in the 54th are in support of uh, this endeavor. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? If so, please raise your hand and we will unmute you. I don't see anyone. Oh, Emmett. Emmett, can you hear us? Emmett? He's unmuted. Can you hear me? 
Oh, we hear you, Emmett. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. My audio may not be great. Uh, my name is Emmett Bell Sykes. I also uh, thank you, George, for for your words. I also represent the the 54th Mass. Um, uh, reenactors uh, organization company a that's been in Hyde Park for years um, I just have a question I don't I don't want to I'm coming on late in the process and uh, respect to Reverend, Reverend uh, Mariama White Hammond and her family I just wanted to ask I guess if if this a lot of us are presenting uh, arguments against the development um, and I guess my question for the developers is considering um, the strong support in the neighborhood for preserving this land, for keeping this history, uh, preserving this history um, for uh, the current generations and future generations to know and be aware of. <clears throat> Is there then, I don't know, a counter or, or uh, a response from the developers that they would consider as a part of the development? Uh, and I don't know in any way how this would work, but would they consider um, some effort to acknowledge the history, acknowledge, um, and, and we're dealing with uh, African American history, and as I always say, as a member of the 54th, it's it's really world history, it's human history. Our story is not limited to Black people, um, but respecting that, but then also respecting our Indigenous brothers and sisters um, who cared for this land thousands thousands of years before we got here. So respecting their wishes and desires for for their property, their land, and I, and I know they. They have different views on ownership of land than we do, uh, but but trying to be as respectful as I can about that. I guess my, my, my question, I'll try to get to it, is would the developers have any response to the concern about the history, about preserving this land, and maybe consider some um, some compromise of some sort? I, I guess that's my, that's my question, as vague as it is. Um, so, I mean, this is just public testimony that the commissioners can ask questions in their comments. This is just any public testimony that you wanted to give. This can't be a back and forth. I understand. I understand. Well, I apologize for that, though. No, no, no. It's no, no problem. And one of the commissioners may want to raise this and stuff. I don't know that a developer is on to answer that question, but uh, okay. we appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Anybody else for public testimony? Members of the public? No, I'm seeing really okay, with that, we'll close our public comment. Uh, back to the commissioners for any um, questions or comments and feedback they want to give or motions that they may want to give. So I just um, wanted to take a moment to respond to some of the concerns that have been raised. So I, I want to note, as uh, uh, William Everson also said, that um, I too struggled with the concern around the question of taking this land by eminent domain. Were it being offered um, outright, there'd be absolutely no question. Um, but I did have some concerns around the eminent domain piece. Um, and I want to also be honest. It's come up in multiple other times. Um, there have been frustrations and challenges around um, some of the racial components of this. As an example, early on, people were talking so much about how this was of importance to Native people and none of them had actually done the work to talk with any of those Native people. But people were speaking on behalf of communities of color, not speaking with those communities of color. And that I found very concerning. Um, it's one of the reasons I asked um, Joe Bagley to engage directly with the tribe instead of other folks speaking on behalf of them. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to say there are tensions in the way this has arisen. Um, concerns about levels of nimbyism in this process. Um, there are lots of things that have emerged in this process that I'm not going to sugarcoat and say are not there. However, from my perspective, and I wanna also state, there have been assertions that this was about a property for one family, but then it's been also asserted this is about three condos and that um, assertion that this was about a single family looking for a place for themselves to live has not also held up in what I have read through the documents. So um, on all sides, there have been um, challenging assertions that I've had to uh, 
sort through to figure out where my perspective lands on this, because um, it is true that the Parks Department had to pursue this on its own before even bringing it to the Parks Commission. And I had to make some decisions about whether or not I felt like that was a good idea to do. I want to name um, that at the end of the day, I feel like um, the public access to um, this water, and again, we are not talking swimming now, but I do wanna think about whether or not that's a possibility as down the line, we have a number of communities where heat, the heat from climate change is causing um, it, it to be insufferable to, for folks to get through the summer and the possibility, the possibility of having access to this space um, feels like one we should definitely pursue. Secondly, I think the question that was raised by uh, the last gentleman about the whether or not this could be negotiated, I did take an opportunity to go see the site. It's not a lot of land to, to both try to negotiate, protecting the archeology, span protecting the historical record and actually giving people access to the water. Um, were the site larger, were there not so many homes already there? Um, we'd be in a different position. Um, but I do, uh, and, and so I think it just would be very challenging to actually consider this real public access to the lake, as well as protect the archeological uh, and historical resources and get all of that done and put three townhouses on. I just, I, I looked at the amount of space and just couldn't see how we would negotiate all of those different uses in the amount of space that exists. But I think there are two things that I wanna to commit to from the Parks Department going forward that I think will uh, support this um, potentially not happening in this way going forward. So one, um, we are really leaning into this conversation about parcel prioritization, making sure that what we are looking at is more um, accessible and, and transparent to the public. I do. I did understand that we did mark this as undevelopable, so I do want to note that. And I, I, but I also know that uh, lots of exceptions have been made in the past, um, and that has led people to believe that if you purchase something, even if the zoning is in one way, that it can be changed, as is has been the case in this particular parcel. That the the while it was called undevelopable, there were willingness to change those codes. We are trying to make sure that we are crystal clear where we are looking to acquire land, what we will push back on if it's developed, so that at least when people walk into these processes, they walk in eyes wide open. This is not the only parcel that is in a similar position where it's been marked as undevelopable, but people have purchased the land working from the assumption that that could be changed. We need to be clearer and transparent about when and where we need to acquire land and what kinds of things will be prioritized. So we have always had a parcel prioritization plan, but I will say that the one that was created most recently is much more user-friendly. Um, I wanna shout out um, Liza Meyer and her team that worked hard on that. Um, and we want to make sure that people are clear and aware. We are also in um, conversation with the BPDA about again, be much clearer about this so that people don't walk in with one impression, spend years and significant amount of time and then um, find themselves in the place that we are at, at this point. So I do think that that is a fair critique um, that we should not have allowed it to go so long down the road before finally intervening. But I think we are putting some things in place so that we can be more transparent about that from the beginning um, and that folks don't feel like their time is wasted. Um, so I, I, I hear those concerns. I hope that we are doing things that's going, that are going to improve um, the process in the future. And once construction were to happen on this land, the pieces that have been described would probably be irrevocably damaged in a way. I couldn't see how we could hold both things at the same time. And that's the challenge. Um, however, I do think as, as, as Aldo stated, um, and as I clearly support, we want to make sure that we are paying um, fair market value, not only just because of the land, but because there was significant time and energy invested um, 
with one impression and then um, that was changed. And I think that that should be um, part of why um, we lean towards a higher value. As the previous gentleman said, I think there were some challenges around really actually being able to fit three units on there. And there were assertions that it was about a family, but then it was about a, so nonetheless, I think paying um, the fair market value uh, honors the fact um, that this was a very long process and um, we could have been more upfront and transparent at the very beginning. It will be also said, we haven't always had the resources to act on the things that we wanted to do and now we do. So I think in the future, um, we will be able to be clearer and transparent at the front side of things um, so that we don't find ourselves in these positions where people do feel like they've invested time that is not fully honored. Um, so those are um, my statements. And I, again, um, I do want to be clear, we are going to be looking to acquire more land that um, there's a lot of significant level of increased development in the city and we need the open space to match that. If they're going to be people living here. We need to make sure that they have access, especially when more and more of those buildings are being built without backyards. Um, we need to make sure that people have access to the space and land where they connect with nature and have a space to recreate and that we are buying parcels that allow our neighborhoods to be protected from all of the impacts of climate change. So. Um, this is not going to be a one-off. This is where uh, the Parks Department is headed overall. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, any other uh, comments, questions from commissioners? I just want to thank the chief for her leadership and guidance on this. That was also very insightful. Uh, it seems like a lot of folks who are in support of this effort were you know, either through their own efforts or the efforts of others made aware of today's hearing. I'm not seeing any representation of the property owners themselves. Um, I, I wish they, uh, they would have. William, up William, and, yes. William, uh, yes. if you look at your participant list, uh, you'll see on it, uh, Mr. Darius J. Gregory. He's one of the two partners in the Lakeside par uh, Development Partners LLC, the ownership group for this. So he's Thank you, quite aware. Thank you. That, that gives me some level of comfort because I thought we were having a proceeding without their awareness or participation, having confirmed that they're on the call, I would at least give them one more opportunity to share their voice before we take any action. Thank you, William. Uh, David or Leonard? Leonard Lee or David Creeley, any other comments or feedback that you'd like to make on it? David's good. Leonard, are you still there? You're still. Seeing no other comments, no hands raised from panelists. Um, anybody want to make a motion? I will make the motion to approve. We have a second. I'll second. There's a motion from um, Commissioner Epperson with a second from Reverend Mariama White Hammond. I will uh, gladly read this uh, again. So please bear with me. Uh, apologies, Karen, for this long one. We'll get it to you in writing as well. Um, this is a vote to execute an order of taking dated February 27th, 2023 to acquire the fee simple interest inclusive of trees and structures standing upon the affix thereto of two parcels containing 51,545 square feet more or less of land now or formerly owned by Lakeside Development Partners, LLC, which land is located at unnumbered AKA zero and four Lakeside Avenue in the Hyde Park District of the city of Boston, numbered in the records of the assessing department as parcels 1812998000 and 1812999000 respectively. And shown as parcel A, on a plan dated May 18th, 2022, 
entitled Plan of Land Taken for Park and Passive Recreation Purposes by the Parks and Recreation Commission, City of Boston, Zero and Lake, Zero and Four Lakeside Avenue, High Park District, Boston, Mass, prepared by Joyce Consulting Group, PC, Braintree, Massachusetts, said land to be used for the community preservation purposes, providing a park, passive recreation, natural, historical, cultural, and archaeological resource conservation, and public access to the great pond known as Sprague Pond, and further voted that the undermentioned be awarded the sum of money set against their name as compensation for damages in their estate at zero and four Lakeside Avenue in the High Park District of the City of Boston by the taking of their interest in the land for the community preservation purposes of providing a park, passive recreation, natural, historical, cultural, and archeological resource conservation and public access to the great pond known as Sprayed Pond. The parcel numbers and title reference are 1812998000 and 1812999000 in the Suffolk County Register of Deeds, book 67248, page 226. The land area is more or less 51,545 square feet. The interest taken is fee simple. The supposed owners are Lakeside Development Partners, LLC, and the amount is $940,000. And further voted that said park shall be known as the Sprague Pond Shoreline Reserve. All in favor. Aye. 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 Motion, motion passes uh, with one recusal, uh, four in the affirmative and one recusal. And then there is a secondary vote. Uh, if you please bear with me on this one as well. This is a vote that the that the Parks and Recreation Commission on behalf of the city of Boston for the community preservation purposes of providing a park, passive recreation, natural, historical, cultural, and archeological resource conservation, and public access to the great pond known as Sprague Pond, having taken by eminent domain the following described parcel of land with funding from the community preservation fund appropriated for the acquisition of open space and parkland by the city council hereby grants a perpetual conservation restriction in said parcel of land to the Southwest Boston Community Development Corporation in accordance with section three of chapter 185 of the Acts of 1875, GL chapter 44B, section 12A, and GL chapter 184, sections 31 through 33. Having found this grant to be in the public interest and authorizes the commissioner of the Parks and Recreation Department to enter into all agreements and uh, documents and to execute any and all instruments as may be necessary to affect said perpetual conservation um, restriction. Uh, Locus, the parcel of land known as Sprague Pond Shoreline Reserve, shown as parcel A on a survey dated May 18th, 2022, titled Plan of Land Taken for Park and Passive Recreation Purposes by the Parks and Recreation Commission, City of Boston, Zero, Dash four Lakeside Avenue, High Park District, Boston, Mass, and prepared by Joyce Consulting Group, PC, Braintree, Massachusetts. All in favor? Aye. Um, we can't see if Leonard is here. Leonard did say it on the phone. Aye. Aye. Got it again. Thank you. We have four in the affirmative and one uh, recusal. With that, the motion is successfully passed. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their time uh, and patience going through this. I also want to acknowledge, um, again, Aldo Guerin for his work on this and research and his upcoming retirement in the next week or so um, with numerous decades of service to the city of Boston Parks <laughs> and Recreation Department. So uh, congratulations, Aldo. And again, thank you for your work on this and all the other projects you've worked through through the decades here at the Boston Parks Department. Thank you. Thank you. With that, um, is the motion to adjourn? Seeing nothing else on the agenda? I'll make a motion. Hey, second. <laughs> Alisa has a motion. Seconded second. By second, thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much for joining us all. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.